let me start with the title for this uh, uh, lecture, or optional lecture, uh, Standing Waves with Complex Exponentials. So you've seen my Standing Waves lecture already. I have uh, done this uh, with uh, um, the real functions, the sine and cosines. And Standing Wave, it's a really uh, fascinating phenomena and the one that's more ubiquitous than you might guess um, just at this early stage. Uh, well, the whole phenomenon of wave is more ubiquitous than you might guess at this early stage. And standing wave is uh, kind of, it's what you get whenever you have a resonance. You saw that in your standing waves lab. So um, the kind of the e easiest, the simplest visualization of standing wave is with a pattern that you will see when you set up a wave on a string. So let's say you have one end of the string tied down at the wall or a post, and you have a string stretched out, and you shake it at the other end. But you shake it in such a small amount that you can consider this end as being fixed down compared to, to everything else that's oscillating. Then you have seen the lecture demos with standing waves of this form. As it shakes up and down, it kind of um, shows this shape. Uh, this is the standing wave of the form where the wavelength is double the length of the string and as you shake it at higher frequency you get um, shorter and shorter standing waves ones that look like this and you know over one cycle well half a cycle it goes into this shape and then uh, uh, just one more that looks like this so you've seen this in demos uh, both the uh, virtual oops <laughs> it's the erase function. Um, so you've seen this in uh, demos, both real and virtual. Um, and then after having demonstrated standing waves, we've talked about what um, kind of um, how to get or in some way to think about what what other things the standing waves are made out of. Uh, with the help of superposition principle, we've given this uh, description of standing wave that um, the second standing wave up there, that that can be thought of as a kind of combination of uh, combination of two waves, one that's propagating to the right and one that's propagating to the left. Uh, I'm not drawing it well. <laughs> oh, imagine they're the same wavelength. Um, and as those two counter propagating waves, they overlap, they add, they, you know, on, go through superposition principle, um, you get certain points, like a point here where, yeah, I didn't draw it right, <laughs> certain points where they always destructively interfere so they don't move up or down. And um, in order to get that description, we gave a description of these traveling waves. And um, when we were, uh, and the, the, the description that we gave was, let's say, the wave that's traveling to the right um, as a function of position and time, it might be some amplitude times the sine of kx minus omega t. And the wave that's traveling to the left, um, that would have been given as um, some amplitude times sine of kx minus uh, plus omega t for the wave that's traveling to the left. And you can figure out what this science means by considering uh, what happens when you consider um, greater time. As you consider greater time, do you have to increase or decrease x in order to stay on the same point of the wave, same phase of the wave? And it's this one that's traveling to the left. It's this one that's traveling to the right. And uh, we've shown with the use of trig identities how by adding these two, you can get a function of the form that looks something like some amplitude, times um, the, the time and the position dependence kind of separates out. So you might have something like a sine of kx times cosine of omega t. So you've seen that done in the real functions and that's a, I, I, I do think it's instructive to go through it. So I wouldn't, uh, would not recommend the people not to go through it. Um, it, does, it does take some use of trig identities and those identities you see you being used are the ones that um, that are quite important in many different physics calculations. The angle addition formula, like that's the one physics ident the trig identity that I would tell you to memorize. <laughs> Hardly not emphasized in. Um, I don't think it's emphasized enough in your calculus and trig trigonometry classes. 
So anyways, um, so now what I want to do for the remainder of this lecture is the second part here, standing waves with the complex exponentials. I want to show you that you can do the exact same calculation using complex exponentials, which you might have seen if you looked at the optional lectures for the, um, for the simple harmonic oscillators. Really, the complex exponential is how we handle any oscillatory phenomena. Um, so how... We handle oscillatory phenomena in physics and engineering. You've seen um, with the simple harmonic oscillators how com use of complex exponentials really simplifies the problem. It turns the calculus problem into an algebra problem. And um, in the context of uh, derivation of standing wave forms, I guess uh, what it does is um, it avoids the need for memorizing trig identities. So uh, in order to do the calculation you saw me do for this, I had to memorize uh, angle addition formula. Now, uh, for this uh, derivation that you will see for the next 15-20 uh, uh, minutes, you will see me using nothing but this one formula, which is Euler's equation that, you sh that should have been covered in trigonometric class. Uh, Euler's equation or Euler's formula. It might be called Euler's formula, let me say. Euler's formula. So it so you should be able to find it in your trigonometry textbook if you still have it. But uh, I do think uh, many math instructors might skip it. I have seen it in trig textbooks in like an optional section, uh, ones that not everyone might cover. So what Euler's formula says is this. You can give a meaning to something like uh, E, Euler's number, to the power of i times, uh, let me call it x. So it's some um, imaginary number up there. You can give meaning to this uh, imaginary exponent. And that meaning comes down to cosine of x plus i times sine of x. And I think, um, wait, do you see me prove this in lecture? You might or might not. Let me assume you do. <laughs> um, the way you would prove it is you prove it using Taylor polynomial. So if you want you to prove it, you can prove using Taylor polynomials. Um, we won't right now because I have limited time to talk about complex exponentials. So uh, when you use complex exponentials to talk, deal with oscillatory phenomena, this is what you do. You take the functions that you might have written in real sin, uh, trigonometric sinusoidal functions, and you write their, um, the complex version of it. So I'm going to write it this way. Um, let me write that. The complex version of the right traveling wave is going to be, it will have the same amplitude, amplitude times, and where I had a sine of kx minus omega t, it's going to be exponential of um, i times that argument that's within the sign. Now, there's a bit there that I have to be careful with. So let me take that care now and fix it now before it gets any farther. So uh, when I was dealing with the sines and cosines, I wasn't all that careful about the meaning of this k wave number and omega angular uh, frequency. Um, so uh, let me write down k wave number omega angular frequency. And by being careful, this is what I mean. Um, it's the question of, are they vector quantities or are they scalar quantities? Uh, when you're looking at these expressions, it might not be obvious to you which one's vector, which one's a scalar, and they're the same. And uh, so the wave number is actually a vector quantity. It's a quantity that corresponds to the, the, prop, the direction of the wave of propagation. So um, in a three-dimensional version, this expression would be written something like k dot product with uh, um, delta r plus omega t. So this uh, wave number quantity is a vector quantity that has a direction. Direction actually matters. And omega angular frequency, this is the one that's a scalar. The direction doesn't matter. The only thing that matters is the size, magnitude. So. Um, so once you, you are aware of that, then you might notice that um, how we assign the minus sign is actually a little sloppy because our change of sign, that happened with omega, not k. 
And if k is the quantity that carries the direction, then uh, um, that's the one that whose sign should change when you uh, change the direction. So let me write it out this way. So um, I think uh, I still need opposite signs between these two. So the way I'm going to write it is let me just swap the orders so that I can take a care with how I write kx. It's going to be minus omega t plus kx. And this plus sign here will mean that this wave is traveling to the right. And let me write my other wave. Um, that's going to be the complex wave traveling to the left. Uh, everything else the same. Um, and it has the amplitude. And... Um, for uh, future convenience, I'm going to add a little term here, which what I which is what I'm going to call phase factor. So, um, it in terms of the complex numbers, the magnitude doesn't change. But what this lets me do is it lets me shift the timing of the other wave coming in, uh, depending on how it's timed. You might get one form or another form. So this is a degree of freedom I'm giving myself so that I can have different ways of adding these two functions together. You know, if anything else, I can set this to zero. Um, in fact, we'll do that as a first example. Um, so that times, I have the same expression, exponential of i times, and the first part will remain the same. It'll be minus omega t. And what I'll now change is have this as minus kx to indicate that it's a traveling to the left. And you can see with the trig functions how whether I wrote both plus kx plus omega t or minus kx minus omega t wouldn't have made a difference. That just changes the sign of the previous coefficient if it's sine because uh, it's an odd function. Or if it's cosine, it actually changes nothing at all because it's an even function. So with the, as we are working with the complex exponentials, I am being careful about this particular meaning of wave number. And making sure I have this <laughs> written in a mathematically correct form, because otherwise I'll get into mathematical trouble. So, with these two functions, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to apply superposition principle and see what I get. See if uh, I can do something similar to what was done before using um, using real functions. Uh, now, it won't look exactly the same because I am using complex functions, so some of those complex factors will remain. What I'm hoping to do is I can keep all that complex stuff with the oscillatory portion of the uh, of my wave expression and uh, kind of the things that, that relate to the spatial representation. Somehow, I can write a real function out of that. So, it's okay. Let's get... Uh, started. I'm going to scroll down and let me just uh, copy this over so that I can refer to it later when and if I need it. So we'll follow the same steps that we've gone through when we did the standing waves derivation with the real functions, which is we are just going to add these two counter-propagative waves together and see what happens. And as we do that, so I do have to make a choice about this phase factor that I introduced for the purpose of giving me some degree of freedom. So we'll uh, work with the phi is equal to zero first. Let's see what we would have gotten uh, if I didn't introduce this and then uh, just go from there. So we are working with a case where phi is equal to zero. That's where these two waves, um, I don't know, have no um, well, I, I don't know. The relative phase is kind of relative to how you uh, ref set the references. So I'll just say this is phi is equal to zero. And I, later on, we'll look at, I don't know, phi is equal to pi or phi is equal to pi over two. <laughs> we'll see how they combine differently. So uh, let me just write that. So my function g will simply be sum of um, phi plus, uh, sorry, uh, f plus plus f minus. That's uh, how my g as my complex uh, combined overlapped interfere the function will be. So I'll just write down G as that. So let me just write out the whole expression. A times exponential of um, I minus omega T plus KX plus um, with a V equal to zero, E to the I zero is just one. So it'll be A times exponential of I minus omega t minus kx. 
And I see some things I can factor out. So I can factor out A, it's common in both terms. And with these two exponentials, I can imagine doing a little bit of exponential algebra to rewrite this as e to the i minus i omega t times e to the i kx and e to the minus i omega t times e to the minus i kx. So I can factor out these two um, common terms. So factoring out those two things, I get a times e to the minus i omega t. I like what I see because I'm separating out, separating out the time dependence the way we did it when we were working with the real functions. And the remaining terms look like it's this and that term. So it will be e to the i kx uh, plus e to the minus i kx. So looking at it, you might think, okay, I think it, I have some sense of what this means, you know, oscillation amplitude and oscillation frequency, you know, kind of like when we are looking at simple harmonic oscillator. Um, now you might be staring at this and not being not being sure what is this. <laughs> so one of the things that you we can do that will actually help us make sense of this expression is to apply Euler's formula. That's why I copied it down here, so that I can just uh, using this expand out what each of these terms are. So let me do that. Let me do it in place just to save a little bit of space here. So um, let me just uh, move this out. And where I had the e to the i kx, I can rewrite as cosine of kx plus i sine of kx. So let me write that up. Cosine of kx plus i sine of kx. All right. Plus, and let's write out what um, what the other term was, where we had e to the minus i k x. So what what this really is is it's a uh, it's e to the i minus k x. So this minus k x goes into argument of the two functions. So cosine of minus k x plus i sine of minus k x. Okay, let me clean this up a little. So if you're looking at this and thinking that um, you just made things more complicated, <laughs> this is why I encourage you to practice uh, simplifications. You can actually simplify this quite a bit. So um, you use the properties of cosine and sine functions. Cosine is an even function and sine is an odd function. And what that means is when you have a minus sign in the argument, you can do certain things with it. With the even function, this minus sign just can be ignored. It's uh, like, you know, even like a parabola is an even function. Whether a minus side, the plus side, the value you get is the same. So um, you just turn the minus into plus, you haven't changed a thing. Uh, with the odd function, that's uh, like uh, um, the, just a line, function of a line, that's an odd function. Where, um, so what it means is, if you go from plus to minus, whatever value you had, you get negative of that value. So where you have minus, you can pull the minus sign out of that um, the function argument. So minus in front, plus here. Now, once you've done that, you should be able to see the simplification. The cosine functions add, and the sine functions, because they are the same term with the opposite signs, they cancel. So I can cancel out the sine of kx, and I get just cosine of kx. So let me just turn this into 2 and get rid of that. Uh, let me just uh, clear clean this all up. So you get a cleaned up version of 2 times a e to the minus i omega t times cosine of kx. So you have this uh, function separated out. You got um, so the, some time dependent oscillatory thing that will have all the complex things in it and you get this real function that basically gives you the shape of your um, the standing wave function. Now the functions that we looked at up, up there they might not have looked like a cosine of kx any of them if I send my um, x equals zero here but uh, imagine if your x was set to equal to zero somewhere in the middle like this is where x was equal to zero then this uh, wave from here, this is cosine of kx. Um, it's a matter of uh, whether you have cosine or sine, it depends on 
kind of setting your um, origin correctly. Or I think if we really want a sine function shape, I think we can get it by uh, messing with this phase factor. So let's uh, try a few other values of phase factor and see if we can get this function to dip go as a sine of kx instead of cosine of kx. So, um, yeah, so one of the phase factors I want you to try uh, let me do it this way. I'm going to move this down and just use this space again so that I can more easily refer to these functions. So uh, let me move this down. So um, so let's do this calculation again, this time with uh, phi value of not zero, but um, so you, if you think of phi as an, a, an angle, you know, from uh, zero to uh, one that go, can go all the way to two pi, which is zero again, the one that's most opposite is pi. So let's see what we get with the phi is equal to pi. So phi equal to pi. And uh, we'll add these two functions together again. My g is a times, uh, let me this time just write this uh, separated. So it will be e to the minus i omega t times e to the i kx. And then um, plus, and this will be a times e to the i pi. And I can simplify this a little bit. I'll do that in a little bit. Uh, that times e to the minus i omega t times e to the minus i kx. So uh, you simplify this the way we were simplifying before using Euler's formula. That's why I had a copy down here. <laughs> so imagine putting in... Uh, so for e to the i pi, imagine putting it into this function here. So cosine of pi plus i sine of pi. Sine of pi is 0. Cosine of pi is minus 1. So this just gives you a factor of minus 1. So when we factor out the common terms again that we are factoring out before, what that expression now becomes is a times e to the minus i omega t. And the terms that remain are e to the i k x and instead of plus it will be minus e to the minus i k x so let's oops uh parenthesis too small. <laughs> um, so uh let's write it out here i think if i uh, save space i can kind of fit it in the remaining space so we'll say this is equal to the terms that we've factored out and I'll just uh, write down each of these terms using Euler's formula. So I have cosine of kx plus i sine of kx. And I'm going to remember this minus sign and put it each time as I write it down. It'll be minus cosine of minus kx and then minus i times sine of minus kx. Let me simplify these minus the signs again using the property of cosine and sine, even and odd functions. So this minus sign just goes away, doesn't do anything. This minus sign gets pulled out and turns this minus into plus. It becomes plus itself. So, okay, so I think I have different functions canceling out this time. So cosine kx still the same term, but this time with a minus sign. So these two will just cancel out, and I can combine these two into... 2i sine of kx. So when you write that down, what you get is uh, 2a e to the minus i omega t times, um, oh, now there's an imaginary number. So i times sine of kx. Now there's a way to um, kind of rewrite this, um, which is kind of uh, work your way back through the Euler's formula, or you can imagine doing this. Uh, I happen to know the exactly right number, so let me just do that with the exactly right number. If you are putting in e to the i pi over 2 into Euler's formula, then what you will get is cosine of pi over 2, which is 0, plus i times the sine of pi over 2, which is 1. This is 0, this is 1. So e to the i pi over 2 is equal to i. Or I can flip that around and say this i, I can rewrite it in terms of uh, as on the, uh, the complex exponential. e to the i pi over 2 
pi over 2. And I can, oh, look at that. I can do a little bit of exponential algebra to combine these two things, say 2a times e to the minus i times omega t minus pi over 2. So that complex vector in front, it's a, it's a phase vector. It amounts to like an offset in the time where you start the time, um, times sine of kx. So if you wanted to get your um, get your um, wave function, the, the get, get your standing wave shape to have look like something based on sine of kx. That's great. You can do that. So start the two counter propagating waves. Start them in such a way that one of them is offset a little bit in time, you know, by this phase vector of pi. Then as they overlap, they in the coordinate system you're using, they will look like a sine of kx. So sine of kx can be used to describe basically all the shapes I drew, you know, with the x equals zero here. Like everything here can be described as some some for some value of k, a sine of kx. So, so yeah, those are the two different phase factor values, which can give you these uh, two different uh, shapes of um, standing waves. I wonder, so I think those are the two examples I've done in the past. Don't know if I've ever done um, the in-between phase factors because, you know, I think you should be able to get something interesting for phase equal to pi over two. Um, so, um, so we've tried two of these phase factors on a whim. Let's try a third phase factor. It's just because, you know, it's a special value, pi over two. Let's see what happens if your phase factor between the two, you know, counter propagating traveling waves is pi over two, you know, quarter of a cycle. So uh, it, we're going to do the same thing. So our phase factor is pi over two. And the sum of these two wave functions that we are naming G is going to be A times, uh, let me separate the exponentials again, E to the minus I omega T times E to the I KX plus uh, A times. And uh, let me do the simplification of the, the phase factor. So, you know, if it's E to the I pi over 2, then working through Euler's formula, that's a cosine of pi over 2 plus i sine of pi over 2. That's a 0, that's a 1. So e to the i pi over 2, that's i, imaginary number. So this factor will be i. Um, okay, uh, times e to the minus i omega t times e to the uh, minus i kx. So we'll factor out the common terms again, a times e to the minus i omega t, a times e to the minus i omega t. So having factored out those common terms, I get a e minus i omega t times e to the i k x plus uh, i times e to the minus i k x. And we'll just do the same thing we were doing before. We'll expand this out using Euler's formula and see what that gets us. Um, not liking the shape of it. <laughs> we'll, we'll see. If it, again, doesn't turn out, I can always edit it out. Um, so I have the factors that I factored out, minus i omega t times, and let me just write this out, cosine of kx plus, uh, not plus, uh, i sine of kx plus, and I'll just remember i with each term. So it'll be i cosine of minus kx, and then i times i from that is minus one. So minus one, or minus, times sine of uh, minus kx. Yeah, I'm not liking that. Um, <laughs> so I, I don't get any nice cancellations. So I'm imagining collecting by the like terms with respect to imaginary number and nothing really cancels or simplifies. I get cosine kx plus a sine kx. Okay. Don't know what I can do with that. And then I get plus i times, um, I guess I could write this as cosine of kx. Cosine of kx 
um, plus sine of kx. Yeah, I don't think I can even, yeah, I can't even really use Euler's formula to write this back into that exponential form. Because all this is just the a plus i. I guess the thing that is interesting is uh, these are the same magnitude. So, um, like it's a plus, yeah, it says though it was a plus i times a. Um, Oh, I think this is going to add up to some sort of circular thing because this has the same magnitude for both of them. Um, uh, or, I don't know. So I, I don't think, it, there might be other contexts where this does have an application, but um, I don't see the obvious application to standing waves that we are looking at. So we'll just cross it out and say, no application to standing waves. And the only two interesting phase differences that would uh, give rise to expressions similar to what you have seen when we were analyzing standing waves with uh, real functions were um, it's these two uh, phase factors. Either, uh, either the phase difference of uh, zero down here, phase difference of zero, which leads to um, the wave form looking like a cosine from a cosine of kx um, with a particular origin set, or it, either you are looking for uh, standing waves of a different shape, or you are looking for um, a kind of where your origin has been shifted over. Uh, one way you can do that is by looking for um, uh, looking at different phase factor. Then you can get uh, with a phase factor of pi, you get. Um, standing waves that go as a sine of kx. So that's a, this is the demonstration of use of complex exponentials to um, do the same derivation that you have seen with the trig functions. Except here, I didn't have to memorize any trig identities. The only thing I had to know was Euler's formula, which is a way to um, uh, kind of convert back and forth between complex exponential form and its uh, representation in terms of uh, sine and cosine functions. So. Um, so yeah, this is the demo. I, I'll uh, 